All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Good morning. This is Monday, the 13th of June in the year of our Lord, 2022. I have to check. It keeps changing every day. Okay, so uh, talking about the uh, the narratives that are out there. Cancel culture is much uh, older than most people think. Bible-believing Christians have always been canceled. Canceled by the established church, stan- canceled by the pagan Romans, canceled by the Protestants uh, uh, during the Reformation. The Anabaptists were routinely burned at the stake or drowned or, if they were lucky, beheaded. Uh, because they believe the scriptures rather than Luther or Calvin or Swingley. Yeah. I say it's, uh, they just continued the, uh, they were very much Roman Catholic, not the, not the Anabaptists. They rejected that. They rejected, they looked in the scriptures and saw a vision of the church, description of the church and of Christianity that was, considerably different from the established Roman and Protestant churches, government uh, wed churches. Living in fornication with the government. Oh, that's that's something like Babylon the Great kind of thing. Um, Yeah, but to... When I was in college, after I got out of the military, before that I wouldn't even consider this. See, I found myself, when I became a Christian in the military, immediately in conflict with the world and the military and everything else because I served a different master now. I, I was born again. I was a child of God. Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior, my King, my God. Not, not the President of the United States. I had a, a change in allegiance, and I recognized that, and I... I remember I went to my commander and said, you know, I've, you know, I'm no longer, I'm now a Christian, Christ is Lord. Uh, that made me a security risk, <laughs> the field I was in. Uh, I would have been much more, I would have been able to explain it much better today than I did then. But, uh, yeah. Anyway. I, I I started. I remember after a while, I uh, worked. I had been working at General Motors. I went back to there. Uh, I started taking some college at one time, uh, both at the ex- University of Wisconsin, both at the local Extension College and in Madison. But I was an outspoken Christian, and I was not terribly impressed by what I saw in academia. I found that professors tend to be liars. <laughs> and cheats and deceivers and are willing to arrange the data. See, which was it? A sociology professor? Yeah, I think it was a soci... I had a couple of professors. Uh, the one of sociology and the other one of... I had for... Uh, was it political science and... No, I don't know about that. I had him for for philosophical ethics. I think I might have had him for political science too, but might have been another one. Anyway, they had a running battle with these guys because their interpretation of the world, science's view of reality, is different than the biblical view of reality, God's view of reality. I want to talk about that a bit because, and, you know, at that time, I was going to go into engineering, but uh, it probably wouldn't have worked out well because I am too outspoken. I mean, an engineer might be able to get away with it. But say if, if, if I went into biology or teaching or um, uh, a- astrophysics or something like or physics or something like that, especially astrophysics, 
because my cosmology doesn't agree with the world's, I would have been canceled. I would have gotten nowhere. Basically, no matter what I did, if I tried to go into some higher position, because my worldview is radically different than the world's worldview, you just don't get ahead. Everybody suspects you as being weird. Different. You're different because you are different. You serve a different god than they do. They serve the god of the world, otherwise known as the dragon, Satan, Lucifer, the devil. But Christians serve the god of heaven, the one who so loved the world he gave his only begotten son to die on a cross to save sinners like me and you. But it, the issue of evolution has been fi brewing. You know, it's like abortion, that struggle. We think that's been going on forever, but evolution. I mean, ever since Charles Darwin uh, started promoting this, he interpreted the data he saw at the Galapagos Islands. But he had a foundation for his interpretation. I believe it was his father or his grandfather was an occultist. And occultism and, say, Hinduism, they all have sort of a similar worldview, an evolutionary worldview that's always been part of a cult, a cosmic progression. And he basically, apparently from that foundation, from those ideas, and looking at what he saw, the different species he saw in the Galapagos, which were different than other places, he came up with this, his theory of biological evolution. Now, did he have any real evidence? No. He was utterly ignorant of, genet of uh, the complexity of life. Uh, it wasn't until quite late, really, and really until, the, until the, well, I mean, DNA is, was discovered, I believe, in my lifetime. Uh, they had no idea. The early microscopes, they thought it was just this goo inside the cells, which is sort of weird. They must have had really bad microscopes because I've got a, 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 a used high school level microscope and, a scope and Olympus here. I mean, not a fancy one. And like under 400 magnification, you look at some algae or something like that, uh, pond scum, and you can see all the, the moving particles in there and the, the strands of chloroplasts and all this stuff. You know this is, this is structure, and you, but you have no idea how complex it is underneath. You can see these are living, moving creatures, even plants. You see the activity inside the plant cells. And then there's things like uh, the larger protozoa that's very clear that they have organs and functions and transport mechanisms. And that was before we knew that they have communication systems that are similar to like human hormones uh, and uh, where you they communicate uh, through chemical messaging and can actually swap uh, genetic material. Sort of like shareware. But now, see, now, you know, as a, with a background in uh, programming and code, I can, you know, the, the DNA is just God's answer, except he uses 4-bit system rather than a 2-bit system, I believe, the, uh, the arrangement of the amino acids. Now, DNA is amazingly complex, but by itself, it's, do I have one laying around here? Well, oh, here's something. Okay, here's a solid state drive. A little Samsung. This is just a half terabyte. A local uh, Walmart doesn't have very good stock. Um, so half a terabyte of data. Now, it's DNA doesn't hold that much on a single shred, but it's rather large. The, the simplest organ, is, I think, blue green algae has has about about a hundred kilobytes of. Uh, equivalent data. It's amazing that they can do all that with that little amount. Uh, God apparently uses compression algorithms. <laughs> they haven't figured out DNA, by the way, yet. But DNA is like this. It's just a storage device. The amazing DNA molecule, the, the double-strand helix, 
with the four amino acid ladder steps, which the sequence of those is where the data is encoded. See, it's, it's not the, the storage medium that is, well, that's amazing in itself, just like this is, but it's the information that's written on the DNA. And there's a whole field of science now, it's called uh, information theory. And one of the laws of information theory is the law of entropy, you know, the physical law too. That information never improves in quality, it only degrades in quality. It can't get better. So how does that work with evolution? It doesn't. It's contrary. It's contrary. It's, it's where does the information come from? It doesn't come from nothing. Well, we live with a science today that believes everything came from nothing. Spontaneous generation. But let's turn over the scriptures and see what God tells us in his first chapter of his books. The Bible's a library of but well, let's go back to Genesis, one of the first of the five books of Moses. And God wants us to know that mankind has been asking forever, where did we come from? Why are we here? Where are we going? Well, God answers all those questions. Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, or empty, or purposeless. Say that, I mean, I mean, it wasn't in its purposeful state yet. See, that's, the word void there can be used uh, in all those senses. And darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the water. So there was already, wa the earth was covered with water. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. Now, see, God creates with purpose. So God created the heavens and the earth, and then he creates the, uh, the then he uh, says, let there be light. Now, when I was, as I mentioned, when I was about in sixth grade, uh, they just, people, uh, a couple of scientists using a small radio telescope discovered the background um, cosmic microwave radiation that they considered evidence of the hypothetical Big Bang, which soon became the dominant cosmological model. Not the only one, but the dominant. Before then, it was pretty much between steady, steady state universe, which doesn't work, how does that work, and oscillating universe, where it goes crunch bang crunch bang crunch bang which is sort of silly uh but they had to account for it they they, they couldn't without a god see this is just like evolution it all starts with the presupposition that god does not exist it's a necessary presupposition in modern or postmodern science didn't always be, doesn't have to be, but that's what's become. It's the dominant narrative. And if you violate the narrative, well, you get canceled. You don't get the job, or you get fired, or you don't get the tenure. Because you don't follow the narrative. As I said, Christians, Bible-believing Christians have always been persecuted, often killed often killed yes just like around the world today look at we've had isis like you videoed and displayed on television the murder of people that confess to be christians the gruesome murder simply because they were christians Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness, and he called the light day, and the darkness he called night. So there was evening and morning the, uh, were the first day. He hasn't had created any light sources yet. He created light, though. Interesting, you can have light without a light source. Light is uh, self-propagating, and it's, it has to do with a constant, and it, the electromagnetic... Uh, uh, the component of light. I can't remember the exact 
physics of it, but yeah, it makes uh, it actually works. Mathematically light uh, photon. Uh, the you have uh, different electrical fields or an electrical and magnetic field vibrating at right angles to each other, and it it at a certain it self propagates at the speed of light. It's it moves. But yes, God could just call it into existence. See, if there's a God, none of this is a problem. God defines reality. He is the ultimate reality. Everything else comes from him. It can't come from itself. It's not God plus. In the beginning was God. So the evening and morning the light and the darkness were the first day. Now, there's no reason that the word day here, yom, uh, almost always means a 24-hour period. And there's no reason not to take it that way. There's, in the context here, the reason is to take it that way. And with, if God exists, there's no reason to dispute that. God Almighty, who calls things into existence out of nothing, why would he take a long time? What would time be to God? That's just a pro that that's just a property of matter. It's just a property of creation. But the God the creation wasn't eternal. This is something God did. There was a before creation and an after creation. Which means God is not outside, uh, separate from time, like the Aristotelians and the Calvinists believe. <laughs> no, time is a product of God doing things. God is not separate from it. He's not embedded in it, though, but he, he inhabits it all. But he's not contained by it. God is, in other words, God is bigger than the universe. You can't measure him. He's, he's in, infinite means a, not a quantitatable uh, quantity. You know, God is immeasurable. It's not a measure of size. It's just saying you can't apply his size to God. Infinite doesn't mean, you know, there's lots of things that are infinite, but doesn't necessarily mean they have a size that's infinite, that, that is bigger than everything. You can't measure God, is what I'm saying. He's beyond that. And he called the light day and the darkness he called night, the evening and the morning were the first day. Then God said, let there be a firmament, firmament an expanse, a s extended surface, uh, in the midst of the waters and let the, it divide the waters from the waters. That's like the continents. Raised levels in the midst of the sea. And there's seven of them. And there's seven mountains the, uh, the beast and the woman sit upon. I think those are seven continents. Or they can be interpret interpreted that way. I mean, uh, God's uh, uh, prophetic visions can have multiple layers of meaning because he's God. Uh, it doesn't mean they're stretchable. It means that, yeah, it can mean this and this and both be true. You know, seven continents and seven hells. I mean, it doesn't mean there's a necessary contradiction between those two. I just find it interesting that it, since it depends on how global the end time events are. Apparently global. See, what power in this world sits on all seven continents? Has military bases all over this world, like 800 built military bases around the world. <laughs> Who does that? China? No. Russia? No. I'll give you one guess. It might be where you live. The United Nations doesn't have military bases around the world. Neither does the Church of Rome. Uh, 
and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament. God made it and divided the waters. So God said, let, let there be, and he, then he makes it, and divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament, and he divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. Now, there's waters in the sea, and then there's waters in the air. You know, we call it like clouds, rain. Of course, their things might have changed, too. Uh, some Christians speculate too much uh, and try to create structures that, that they don't have any evidence for and that are physically impossible. Like a crystalline, frozen canopy of water over the earth. I've heard that one. Come on. You just, you know, no. I can't imagine how would that would work. I mean, already, see, if, if there was a frozen shell of crystalline ice, uh, and that was the waters above the firmament. No, no, no. no. The firmament here is the land. And God called the... Uh, so he has a firmament here that divides waters and a firmament that divides... Another one he called the firmament heaven. And the uh, the sky, I would say here, is, see, heaven in the Bible can mean multiple things. It could be the, uh, the, the atmosphere around the earth. It could be the stellar uh, heavens, and it could be heaven where God is. Uh, Paul talks about God, God in the seventh heaven. Or up to the, he was caught, caught up to the third heaven or something. That's not a study right now, so I'm just going off the top of my head. And God called the firmament. Uh, so it was an, it, a firmament, is the expanse, he established this. And then he says, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together in one place and let dry land appear. And it was so. And God uh, called the dry land earth and gathered together the waters, he, which he called sea, and God saw that it was good. So then God goes on and says, Let the earth bring forth grass, and, uh, the herb that yields seed, and let the uh, and the tr fruit tree that bears fruit according to its kind. So here we have the first um, indication of living kinds, uh, similar to the idea of species, whose seed is is in itself. In other words, it self-replicating living plants on the earth in, in variety, both grasses and herbs and fruit trees are trees that yield fruit. All trees bear some kind of a fruit. And the earth brought forth grass, and the, God said, let it be, and it was so. And the herb that yields seed according to its kind, and the tree that, that uh, yields fruit, whose seed is in itself according to its kind, and God saw that it was good. So the evening, uh, the, uh, the evening and morning were the third day. And then on the fourth day, God says, and, and God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and seasons, and uh, for days and for years. And let there be lights uh, in the firmament of heaven to give light on the earth. And it was so. so. In other words, the purpose was to give light on the earth and as a mean of, means of telling time. Just like in agricultural cultures, the, the telling of times and seasons is very important. When do you plant and when don't you plant? Unless you want to starve. God set them in the firmament of heaven to give a light on the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the, the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. The, so it was the evening and morning of the fourth day. So the, second, the day after he creates plants, he creates the sun and the moon and the stars. See, if there's a God, if there's the all-powerful God of the Bible, then none of this is the problem. If you don't believe in God, or you believe in the God of the the gods of the Greeks, or something like this, then all of this is a problem. And then on the fifth day, God brings forth birds, 
And the sixth day, God brings forth uh, uh, animals on the land. And on the, six, uh, uh, the fifth day, and the sixth day, God creates man in his own image. And then we know what happened with Adam and Eve. They fell. Okay, so that's God's story of creation. God did it. And if you go follow the biblical dating of the generations, the creation of Adam was roughly 6,000 years ago. There's some eh, uncertainty, but the uncertainties tend to average out. And But we can say from the scriptures, it's uh, roughly 6,000 years ago. Now, there's lots of mathematical and uh, reasons looking at current things that, that indicate that is correct. If everything came into being, the Earth came into billion, being, say, 5 billion years ago, and life evolved, and, and human beings came into existence, say, a million years ago, how many human beings would be on the planet today? See, there's a problem here. You've got self-replicating systems. Human beings can easily double their population every 40 years. There are populations that, well, at least a couple of decades ago, were multiplying uh, every 20 to 25 years. The, the Palestinian refugees and the, the Anabaptists, the, the, the Amish in America, had a, a, a doubling time of about 23 years. They marry young and they produce lots of children. You know, six, seven, eight children is common. So, uh, and it has to be so, because otherwise something could happen. See, if you don't have a, a rapid multiplication potential, then disasters can wipe you out. You can't recover. Even the bubonic plague... Uh, humanity recovered from that very rapidly because people are able to reproduce children fairly rapidly. God knows how to do things. God created man in his own image, and in the image of God he created him, male and female. He created them, and it goes into details more later. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. This is one of the reasons I think the end, the coming of Christ is, is uh, near. This is the first commandment he gave to man. Man in the generic sense, male and female. He created man, male and female. Uh, most languages have a generic masculine. That means both. Generic use. And... The first commandment was to fill the, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it, to have dominion over it, over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves on the earth. That has been accomplished. We've filled the earth. We've subdu subdued it. We, we have to protect the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and the things that move because... We, we recognize that we can misuse creation, even as sinful, and damage it. Like the fish populations in the ocean, are, the, the edible fish are uh, diminished. You know, it's hard to find uh, ocean perch or cod or a lot of fish that used to be abundant and cheap and big, good-sized ones. And, you know, there's, now there's... See, when I was... Uh, Younger, there was, uh, you know, like back about my one was in school, about uh, uh, four billion people on the earth. Now there's eight billion people on the earth. Twice as many people eating twice as much stuff, with a lot more wealth to buy it up. We got Chinese sending their sh fishing boats out into other people's waters, the Chinese fishermen, not saying the Chinese government's doing it, and uh, they have to be shooed away with armed Coast Guard in many places. They're stealing other people's fish out of their own local waters. Uh, competition. 
getting worse. But the, the humanity has filled the the habitable places of the earth. There isn't much left. There is no new world to discover. And people like Elon Musk planning to colonize Mars, he's nuts. He's just plain nuts. That's a place you go to die. One accident up there and you're gone. Outer space is not for human habitation. God meant the, built the earth for human habitation. And you notice here that the, uh, this, the heavens, the moon and the sun and the stars, all that, is for the earth. The earth is the center, the spiritual center. I'm not saying it's a geographical center or the gravitational center. It is the center of God's creation because that's everything else is made for it. That doesn't mean the sun has to circle the earth. We don't want to go into that kind of stupidity. And there's people that call themselves Christians that do, that believe the earth is flat, and they're nuts. You know, you cannot believe things that are absolutely contrary to easily established facts. Just like today with the Internet, you could contact somebody, say, in Europe, and say, could you give me a bearing on the sun? And you could say, take a bearing where you are here, say in the United States. I could take a bearing here on the sun. You know, actually go and measure, not, not use a computer, but go and measure the angle to the sun, and somebody else could measure the angle to the sun at, on the other side of the world or wherever, and we could compute the distance to the sun, and we could actually compute that as it travels. And prove that the sun, that the the Earth is circling around. The, the sun can't circle the Earth because we could know its distance, compute its size, all by some very simple measurements. So when people come along and are utterly ignorant and prove that by saying the Bible teaches the Earth is flat and has four corners, they're nuts. They have no, they do a disservice to Jesus Christ. You have to read the Bible with understanding and understand that language metaphors and other things can't be you know the four corners of the earth refer to the four cardinal directions north south east and west which apparently has been around for a long time because everything rotates east to west and north north and south is the axis of the earth the very fact that there's four cardinal directions proves and the reason there is is because the Earth is round, basically, and rotates on an axis. Now, another way of proving it is how come the sun rises and sets uh, in a different place at a different time than it does where you are? Why are there time zones if the Earth is flat? Oh, well. There's a lot of Christ is wounded in the house of his friends by people that think they're doing a good thing. But God created the earth is the center of creation. I'm not saying it's the center of the physical universe. That's irrelevant. It's irrelevant. There was a big bang. God created it in the beginning. He said, let there be light. And there was light. Now, people, well, how did it get, if, it, if he did this 6,000 years ago, how can we measure this stuff and it appears to be millions or billions of light years away? Because the scripture says, and I believe it's seven places, that God stretched out the heavens. There's something called the Hubble shift, red shift. In other words, we can look through a spectroscope at a star and you can see the characteristic spectrum lines of, of hydrogen and helium and uh, calcium and carbon and oxygen and all these elements right they're in there's specific frequencies that are in specific parts of the spectrum perhaps you in uh, high school or college you look through a, a you know a, an educational spectroscope you know the you measure the angle on the prism oh, those, are, those are cool things and uh, it doesn't take really high tech to to do science the high tech stuff just makes it complicated 
But see, that is those are markers, and when you look at a star, they they saw that the markers tended to be shifted toward the red. And science was aware of Doppler shift, you know, the sound as it goes by you, it starts at a higher pitch coming toward you, and as it goes past, it goes to the low pitch. That kind of a noise. And that's uh, because of the source emitting the frequency as it comes toward you, the, the waves are compressed, and it, it sounds to you like a higher frequency. And as it goes away, they're, they're elongated, which is a lower pitch. So they saw that the stars had a red shift, in other words, toward a lower frequency, which indicated the stars were going away from us, most of them. That's called the Hubble constant. Now, it, currently, it doesn't work with a lot of measurements. So it's like, but the Bible actually explains these things and says that God stretched out the heavens, which would produce a red shift. It, it'd be good if the scientists actually read the Bible. <laughs> but they're trying to get rid of the idea of God. That's the thing. that it, Science has become an anti-God enterprise, an anti-Christ enterprise. Didn't start out that way, but that's where it is today. Because that's the prevailing narr the prevailing narrative is Carl Sagan's narrative. There is no God. That the universe is all that is or ever has been or ever will be. But it's all going to oblivion. The law of entropy says it's all going to die heat death. It has become a uniform nothing. Of course, uh, this whole science, too, back before... Uh, the, the, the scientists of like the 17th century and that believed in spontaneous generation. Frogs and snakes and creepy crawlers just spontaneously came into existence in the muck and mire of the swamps. Spontaneous generation. How come horses don't spontaneous generate, spontaneously generate? It was just nonsense. It was just nonsense because they would not believe the Bible defies observation. They just say these things and call it science, call it knowledge. It's really just a narrative, a fairy tale that they tell you and people accept it. People like to believe lies. They make them comfortable. Like the government will take care of you. It's a lie. The government doesn't have the power to do that. It's like health insurance. Like insurance will keep you healthy. That's a lie. It doesn't have the power to do that. Or life insurance, yeah, that's a good one. That's really death insurance. It, it, only, it doesn't pay you any, anything until you die. It doesn't pay you either. Uh, Orwellian language, it's all over in this culture, all over in the world. So, uh, anyway, but th th this is the origin according to the God, according to the Bible. And so uh, science has noticed some things, and that said, well, the Earth it seems to be expanding. So, well, the, the idea of a, a, an origin and the universe expanding in itself is not contradictory to the Bible. The Bible says God has stretched out the heavens. Repeatedly, God says that in the prophets. So that would account for some of that. The thing with the Big Bang, though, is ima imagine, do a little... Uh, imaginary experiment in your head here. So, so say, say a fireworks shell, you know, ones that have the big white stars or something like that. When they explode, do you see the stars going away and then being attracted to each other and coming together in clumps under the influence of gravity? Now, there's the gravitational force between everything that flies off in an explosion. But there's a greater force that's causing this stuff to fly off. And uh, like a, a, an explosive shell, a, a bomb, an artillery shell. When it explodes, the, the pieces that have exploded in the air, it's easier to figure this out. And, uh, there's nothing to stop it. So they go out in directions away from the center, away from their original position. They're being propelled outward. Gravity never brings them back together, does it? 
Gravity never forms them into structures as they're whizzing off into nothing, nothing land. It can't. Gravity is not the strongest force in the universe. And uh, it's not sufficient. If something has, in order for something to explode, there has to be a force stronger than gravity holding it together, right? So if you had a planet that exploded, for example, or a star that explodes, that means the force that was causing the, the star to expand very rapidly is greater than the gravity that's holding it together, like a nova, supernova. They do happen. Uh, so, but we never see those things reassembling themselves or forming themselves into new structures. So let's take a look at this. This is just one nearby example that you can see for yourself. Uh,
say is see, creation. Why do we see the appearance, of, uh, you know, according to the the standard narrative of an old universe and an old Earth? Why don't you know why why can you why do we see these massive deposits of things and everything else? Well, one thing is that there was a flood, a apparent, uh, apparently a global flood. And science says, well, explain that. Well, I don't need to explain it. The Bible declares it as truth. And when I, I can look at a huge gravel deposit or something like that, I mean, uh, there are massive, massive deposits, sedimentary deposits and coal deposits and everything else. And I look at that and say, well, the, the flood, that's evidence of the flood. The, the huge amounts of vegetation buried and... Uh, animal life buried and uh, uh, sedimentary rock that forms very rapidly and then you can have uh, also ideas of uh, sedimentary sorting by mass that tend the the light stuff goes to the top and the heavy stuff goes to the bottom all these things uh, we do see evidence of that in, when we look at the world See, it's, it's, it, what, do you interpret the world through what God has said? When I do that, I see it's consistent with God's word. And when there's something that seems to be non-consistent with God's word, it's, I'm probably not understanding it right. There's probably another explanation. But most things are completely consistent with what God says, including human activity and human nature. Explains why people do evil things, like kill children. God explains that. Science can't explain that. Science can't account for morality at all. Science is immoral, amoral. See, science has nothing to say about human rights either or human responsibilities. You can't derive values from science. Whatever it is, is. So it's not a guide to what we should do. At best, it can describe what is. But then when they try to interpret it according to their presuppositions and their own twisted morality, well, that turns into something else. So there's all these anomalies out there that get buried. You know, it's, nobody brings up, they just don't know to bring it up. It's like, okay, Hubble, rub, shift. Well, what about the Andromeda Galaxy? Why is it headed toward us at rather high speed? Don't worry, it'll be four or five billion years from that. And there'll be a new creation before that anyway. This this whole, the scripture says, too, it says that, no, see, the ancient world had no knowledge of this stuff. But the Bible reveals things that are completely consistent with the scripture, with, with reality. Uh, it talks about the heavens and the earth wearing old as a garment. Well, that's completely consistent with the physical law of entropy, otherwise known as the second law of thermodynamics, that everything wears out. It all decays. Creation itself, I mean, it's, it's, we know that. It all gets old, like we get old. And that's not necessarily because it's the way it's supposed to be, but because of man's sin. See, all creation is focused on man and God. It's, it's you know, just these people that just will not believe what God has said. But none of them, no one has ever been able to prove the Bible is wrong. But most people don't even want to deal with that issue because they're afraid they'll find it's true. Okay, let's, as far as the Bible being true, what's the evidence that the Scripture is true? What, what's the evidence that we should look to God's Word to understand the origin and nature of things and why they are the way they are today? Well, let's go over to the New Testament. Started at Genesis. Let's go over to uh, Acts chapter 17. And this is the uh, Paul... And he's at Athens, and he's upset because he sees all the 
the idolatry of the Athenians. In verse uh, 17, starting at verse 22, Paul says this, Then Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. Well, the King James translates that in a little more. Uh, it's uh, the King. How does uh, King James translates it? Very superstitious, but uh, I don't think that's necessary. As for I, uh, for as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I found an altar. He Paul is just incensed by the, what he's seen here. He's worked up by it, just like people get me worked up by their stupidity, stupidity and godlessness and arrogance and everything else. I found an altar to the, uh, with this inscription. So an, a, a, a monument to it. To the unknown God. Interesting cultures have things like that too. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing, or you worship in ignorance, him I proclaim to you. You can imagine the Athenians might have said, well, you're pretty arrogant, aren't you? God who, made he God, God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. See, the God, who, the creator, this isn't the Greek gods. They had no creator. But the, the philosophers realized there had to be the, the prime mover, the first cause. At least they understood that much, that the Greek gods were nonsense. They were just human projections. But there had to be a cause. So Aristotle had his, his, his cause and the, the god that he imagined as his, in, the, in his idea of perfection, that god is not the god of the Bible, which is why Calvinism is so twisted in some areas, and Catholicism and everything else, because Aristotle was picked up by Augustine and by... Uh, Aquinas. Aristotle's metaphysics are a corruption. They're not biblical. They're right. Aristotle's and Aquinas's and Augustine's idea of God is not biblical. Which is why I've rejected Calvinism. But Calvinism simply held on to the same metaphysical ideas about God as Roman Catholicism did. And I think it's also to a lesser degree in orthodoxy because they're not really big on Augustine. <clears throat> Nor is he worshipped with men. So God doesn't live in a little house you build for him. God builds his own temple. Uh, yeah. And it's not the, the little thing that, that used to exist in Jerusalem that was not really God's temple. God's not contained by such things. Because he created it all. How can he be contained by something men can make? Nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything. Now, uh, Augustine and Calvin and Aquinas, they would agree with this. And I'd say, yeah, you know, they weren't wrong on everything. Their absolute changelessness of God in every way is where they really get themselves into trouble. Uh, Aristotle's idea of, of the necessary perfection of God was not biblical. And that's, that's where they get in trouble. And that leads to all kinds of weirdness, like the eternal decree of all things. That's where that comes from. It comes from Aristotle indirectly. In case you wonder why Calvinists are so weird, the ones that know, the real Calvinists, not just the five points of Calvin, which isn't Calvinism. It's just an effect of Calvinism. <clears throat> Nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything. You know, like people that, I get a little annoyed at offering time at church because, you know, like as if God needs our offering. Or that money can further the kingdom of God. Eh, that's not really a good idea. God doesn't need our money. 
And the very idea, this is one of the areas that the, the Southern Baptists really irritate me because they're, they're so humanistic and program-centric that uh, the idea that man does it. No. No, it's God that does it. God saves. He doesn't need our possessions or us, really. Since he gives to all life and breath and all things. All things come from God. All good things. And he made from one blood, Adam, every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth. Genetically, human beings are human beings. There's genetic variation, but we are all a single species. Right? The idea of separate, the origin of separate human races, which science in the past has proposed, and sometimes racist pseudoscientists do that today, is false. And it happens all the time. Today in America, you have uh, have children reproduced by so-called multiple races. You have uh, a lot of, in this particular area. There's a lot of blacks and whites. There's a lot of white women married to black men. Usually, you don't see it the other way around. But that's, I don't know why that is. But uh, uh, there's nothing biblically wrong with that. It might seem a little odd, depending on what you were raised with. I mean, where I was, we didn't even see black people. <laughs> yeah, they kept them to another community to the south. Literally. It was pretty, uh, Janesville, Wisconsin kept itself pretty white. Uh, the blacks were located mostly in Beloit, especially South Beloit, which was across the state line. Uh, which wasn't very far away. But, I mean, it was just, that was the way it was. See, segregation in the North was at least as bad as it was in the South. It just wasn't so explicit, usually. Although it was written into property, you can't sell this house to a black man. Yeah, my dad had a house like that. Not that it was legally, uh, could be legally enforced at that time because those restrictions. If you got a restriction against the law, the restriction is nullified. So God made from one blood, from one man, every nation to dwell in all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwelling. So God has determined a lot of things for a purpose, so that they should seek the Lord in hope that they might grope for him, like groping around in the darkness and just stumble across God. Though he is not far from each one of us. See, this is the Apostle Paul talking to a bunch of pagans in Athens, sophisticated pagans, the Areopagus. For in him we live and move and have our being, as also some of your own poets have said. For we are also his offspring. So Paul is saying that even yourselves, even among your own poets, they recognize that this God, a God, the creator exists, and he has created man, that we are the offspring of God. Adam was called the son of God. Son by creation. Therefore, the therefores in the Bible are always good. Since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think of the divine nature, uh, the divine nature is like silver, gold, or silver, or stone, something shaped by art and man's devising. So the, all these stone images and icons and all this stuff, God's not like that. If we're the offspring of God, he's not like that. We're not like that. Why would God be like that? Truly, these times of ignorance, God overlooked in the past. Man's ignorance. But now commands all men everywhere to repent 
to change your mind and change your attitude about God and about sin. To repent. Because, now why should you repent? Why should you turn to God? Why should you seek God? Because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the proof God has given to all humanity that Jesus is the Son of God, he is the Messiah, he is the Christ, he is the Savior, he is the Lord, and he's the coming King and Judge. If you don't want to believe the Bible, then you have a logical duty, a moral duty, to demonstrate that Jesus Christ did not rise from the dead. If it's all a fable, it should be fairly easy to do. But there were fi over 500 eyewitnesses. We don't have the testimony of all of them in the scripture, but we have the testimony of the apostles who were chosen by Christ to be eyewitnesses and to preach the gospel. That they preached it based on the resurrection of Christ. If he had not they would not have gone about preaching a gospel if Christ was still dead. Not only that, the existence of the church from the beginning, in the face of hostile uh, efforts to suppress it, prove that the church believed that he rose from the dead. We've got the testimony of the apostles. Uh, uh, John and Matthew being first-hand eyewitnesses, and Luke and Mark, uh, Mark a little odd here. Uh, Luke is uh, secondhand. He was like an historian. He interviewed the eyewitnesses. And Mark may have been there. Uh, it seems that Mark may have, may have been among the disciples of Jesus, but not one of the, the 12. Uh, he may have very well, there's an indication he might have been there when Jesus was arrested. If he was, and he was uh, related, the son of uh, one of the Marys, perhaps, uh, they, uh, then there's a good chance he also was an eyewitness of the res resurrected Lord. Because that on one occasion, 500 people saw him. Not, not some mirage in the sky, but he physically was present. He ate with them. They handled him. They touched him. He was with them over a period of 40 days to demonstrate conclusively that he had indeed bodily risen from the dead. And then he ascended in heaven, in their sight. Not just vanished, ascended in their sight. And then sent forth the promise of the Holy Spirit, uh, which came 10 days later on Pentecost. So this, if, if you're going to deny the truth, the truth of the scripture, God says he's given proof to all men by raising Christ from the dead. You have to disprove that. If you want to be rational and logical and honest, you have to disprove the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But if Jesus Christ did rise from the dead, then you have an obligation to believe what Christ taught and what his apostles taught. And Christ bore witness to the prophets, including the creation of man in his Gospels, the Sermon on the Mount. In other places. So, if you refu if you refuse to search out the truth about the resurrection, you are willingly ignorant, and you demonstrate your guilt by refusing to even investigate the proof God says He's given that Jesus is the Savior and the coming Lord and King. You have a responsibility. 
If you choose not to, you demonstrate that you don't care. That you love your sin. You don't want to be saved. You don't want to be delivered. You just want to go to hell. Because that's what will happen. You hate God. You don't care what he did. You don't care that he sent his only begotten son into the world to die on a cross for your sins. You are rejecting God's salvation, including the gift of eternal life. God says he's given you proof. You have a duty to check out that proof. If you doubt it, you have a duty to carefully investigate it. And if you can demonstrate that Jesus didn't rise from the dead, the preponderance of evidence says he didn't, well, then don't believe. I guess God didn't give you proof. But God says he did. Prove him wrong. Or accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Trust in him and what he did. And demonstrated he did by rising from the dead. If Jesus had not paid for your sin, he could not have risen from the dead. 